So um, yesterday we talked a little bit about the the use of theater in uh, other realms different than the stage. The use of theater in the stage of life, and um, and specifically the use of theater in working with communities. Many of us know about the use of theater in pedagogy and in education and the use of theater in therapy, um, drama therapy, psychodrama, etc. And uh, so yesterday I focused mostly on, on the work that I have been doing, taking the work of Augusto Boal and other methodologies to working with communities in using theater as a laboratory to look for alternatives to, to transformation, alternatives to violence, alternatives to, to the conflicts that communities are dealing with everywhere. I don't know any community that is not dealing with trouble, <coughs> or any human being that is not dealing with trouble. But today we separated another aspect of the work that I do, which is using theater as ritual. And of course there is a difference between ritual and, and art. The, the role of art is to transform reality through beauty, is to, to look for the truth through beauty, or any other definition that you might have. Uh, yet, uh, most theater is a ritual, and most rituals are theatrical. Rituals involve uh, mythology, involve storytelling, involve masks, dance, uh, drums, uh, uh, characters, so sometimes characters that are connected to gods and goddesses. And so what I notice working with the groups that I work with mostly in war zones is that a lot of the stories that come out in the process have to do with the woundedness that the people in that community are dealing with. And it felt to me that it was wonderful to be able to tell the stories and it was wonderful to be able to transform the stories into something beautiful. But still, uh, when we did the plays, we, I had 40, 50, 60 people looking at a play that remind them of all the disappeared, or remind them of all the people that have been killed in the massacres, or remind them of the people that disappeared in the earthquake, for example, in Nepal. Uh, 34,000 people buried alive uh, in a few seconds and kill. So, so I started to do to look for other ways. And uh, there is something called playback theater. Jonathan Fox, maybe some of you have heard about it. In playback, there is usually a crew of actors, usually four actors and one musician. And they go to a community and they invite people from the community to tell a story, a real story. And then they use different methods to enact the story, to play the story back to the audience. And it's a beautiful methodology. I've seen it done in different places. There's a good friend of mine who right now has something called the Freedom Bus. And it's a bus that goes to different villages in Palestine. And they bring the actors from the Freedom Theater and they enact the stories that people tell them. So it creates a, a very emotional playing field because people watch the stories told back to them in a beautiful way. However, also with that methodology, I noticed that a lot of emo that rivers of emotions were created, but the question was, what do we do with this? Now, how do we close this? Or how do we close it in a way that reopens it in a different place? How do we envelope what has happened and so I have been looking for, for ways to do that, and stories are one way. And maybe today I will share a story and, and we can see what happens with that. This is something I learned from a mentor of mine, Michael Mead. I don't know if anyone has heard about Michael Mead. He's not well known in academic circles. I think he's one of the most powerful thinkers that we have in this country. Uh, original thinkers, he's a mythologist and a storyteller. He had been associated with the mythopoetic men's movement, with James Hillman and Robert Bly. That's those were the people that started this. But he has continued for the last 25 years to meet with men and, and women, but mostly with men. That's how it started, asking the question, what does it mean to be a man in this culture? 
It's nothing to do with talking about women. First of all, what does it mean to be a man in a culture where, for example, in prisons, the number one characteristic that you find in prisons is the absence of male, the absence of fathers. It's not, it's no longer poverty or violent environments, it's the absence of fathers. And so anyway, so through Michael Mead, I, I learned uh, the use of uh, stories, and I will share a little bit about that with you. So I, I was looking for ways to go beyond theater. And as a therapist, I also worked as a therapist for 20 years. I worked mostly with groups at the end of my career. I was doing groups in, in LA. I created an art therapy program called Cityscape uh, to protect children from therapists. Well, not from therapists, therapists are good people. <laughs> but from the tools that most therapists are given to work with kids, especially behavioral modification and all those horrible things. So uh, we created a program where kids came for three hours and played. And played. And we played with music, we played with dance, we played with theater, we did rituals, uh, we played with stories. We wrote stories that they wrote, we painted, etc. So for three hours, the kids were able to be themselves after they had been asked to sit for five hours or something like that in school, especially the so-called ADHD kids. <coughs> and you know some of us are kinetic learners. And those of us who are kinetic learners have a hard time sitting for five hours. I think any human being has a hard time sitting for five hours. One thing that happens when you do that is that when you do this, all the blood goes here. <laughs> and the poor brain gets anoxia. It cannot think. <laughs> the poor brain is asking, gasping for oxygen, you know? And we still believe that we can think while sitting. It's, it's insane. You cannot think. There, there's no connections going on in the brain. What you can do is repeat what you think you know. And who's interested in that? <laughs> anyway, but so. Looking for, uh, for ways out, I started going more and more into ritual. Because I started working with youth, uh, working with youth at risk. Uh, I don't know any youth who is not at risk today, in today's world. And look, I'm working with gang members and noticing that probably gangs are the only or one of the few institutions in our culture that still has rights of passage. Sororities and where is it called the other one? Fraternity. And fraternities also have rights of passage. The army has rights of passage. But I felt that there was something that the youth were looking for in the jump in. Uh, have you ever seen a jump in? When a kid gets beaten for one, one minute by his homeboys, but beaten seriously. And then after the broken teeth and the broken bones and the broken nose and the sweat and the spit and the blood, then you are a homie. And now you get a tattoo or you get a piercing. So I was looking at what was there. What was the psyche looking for? And I started looking at rituals of rites of passage or rituals of initiation. And then uh, I lost my brother, uh, my youngest brother died of AIDS. Uh, a horrible death in Colombia. When he died, he was only the bones. Uh, and he has a very painful death. And then two years later, my other younger brother was kidnapped, horribly tortured, and killed by the paramilitary death squads in Colombia. So I had to deal with my own morning. Being away from home, away from my family, away from my parental uh, village, it's difficult to be alone in a country and then you start losing people. So I started working with hospice, the hospice of Pasadena. So I, I became a midwife into death. I started working with people who were dying. And I did a few plays also with them to tell the stories. But then I noticed, uh, if you want to learn about life, work with death. It's very interesting when you accompany people every day and you see them do this. It's amazing. It's an amazing, uh, very honorable moment for you. <laughs> and sad too when you are sometimes you are the only person there besides the technicians. So you notice that most of us are now dying with strangers. And so I work in City of Hope. I don't know if you know City of Hope in Arcadia. It's one of the most famous hospitals in the world. 
they did the first bone marrow transplants, uh, etc. And there are 365 people who died there, mostly kids, of cancer. And they cannot talk about death. 365 people are dying in this place and no one talks about death because it's the city of hope. A very narrow understanding of hope. So I created the first bereavement program in, in the hospital. And so I started in being interested in death. And the, one of the few things that I learned from people who were dying is that it looks like that when you die, when you get to wherever it is that you go, they don't ask you if you were a good husband, or a good son, or a good daughter, or a good friend, or a good lover, uh, or a good... They seem to ask, did you live your life? And, and I found that very interesting. Did you live your life? Not how much uh, checking accounts you, you accomplished, or how successful you were in your career, and I noticed that very few people seem to be dying tranquil. Seem to be dying while alive. The African said, when death find you, let it find you alive. And that seems to mean let it find you living your life. Not breathing, eating, consuming, etc. So that was also a place where I noticed the absence of ritual. We are probably the only society that has lost the most sophisticated rituals throughout history are the rituals of death. And often were places for art. Most of the art that we found from ancient cultures was with the buried people. And they allow us to figure out how these people did. So I think it would be a good job for artists to create good funerals. Because the funeral is a good way to say goodbye and to honor the life of the person that is leaving us or this passing. So I was also looking for a new job for artists because most of us are not doing, doing very well. But anyway, but what I'm saying about this is that I was trying to find a, that place where we create meaning. And yes, in therapy, I work as a therapist and it's important what we do and we can save lives and and in certain moments in life, having someone to listen to you is very important. But when I was doing this work with the communities, I was saying, what else can we do? So I started asking the communities for their rituals, and noticing that most of our rituals had been lost. And especially in places of war, and conflict, and violence, the first thing that goes is whatever uh, activities that brings us together. So I started designing rituals with people. Uh, so maybe yesterday, I don't know if I mentioned this, for example, I was in a community in Valle del Cauca in Colombia where after eight days of working together doing theater, there were so many dead people. This was one of the first places where the paramilitaries began cutting people in pieces, uh, descuartizando with motosierra, with uh, chainsaws. They would cut the bodies and throw half to the river and throw half to and bury half of it. So a lot of people were disappeared. So then he said, why don't we create a ritual for them and also to recuperate the meaning of the river as a source of life and, and beauty and a place of recreation, etc." So we decided to create little ships, ship, no, balsas. Uh, boats. Little boats with bamboo. And then each family decorated grass. Yeah. Right, but little ones, not, not one that you sit on, just for the soul of the lost one to, to, to be in. And they decorated it, and then they put a candle, and they put a picture when they had pictures. And, and then we were going to deposit them in the river, and we created two huge ones with big photographs. And, uh, and then I asked two friends who were dancers, and I wanted them to be like the communicators between the the living and the dead. So also because the river was quite scary. And uh, so I didn't want people to go in the river. So they they were they had they were tied with lassos in case that something happened and they will do some kind of dance while taking the soul into the river. Well and then we were drumming. I told them a song from Burkina Faso from, that I learned from Manidoma Somme, a shaman, and they love it. So we were singing this song as we were depositing the souls of, of 400 people that had been killed and probably were thrown to the river. 
And I noticed that after two or three of the women gave the, the drafts to the dancers, they themselves started going into the river. So you can, I mean, you can plan part of the ritual, but the rest of it, <laughs> the soul just takes over. So I then went to tell these women, no, you cannot go in the river. So I, I called 10 men and I said, you go south, uh, down the river in case that any of them falls and uh, just get them out. And they immediately, they just took their money out and, and they went to the river. So, and it was uh, sunset. And so imagine 500 people singing songs and depositing these beautiful little things and you see them going down the river. So a ritual is something that could be very simple, very, very, the, the, the important thing about the ritual is the intention. So it seems to me that what it allowed us was to live together the morning, part of the morning process that we each were trying to live in ourselves, by ourselves. And there are lots of people, especially in war zones, I was last year in Syria, that are not even having the opportunity to bury their loved ones. I, I will argue this country, this culture, has not known the civil war. That was one of the bloodiest things that ever happened. Has not known the genocide of the Native Americans. Has not known the amount of slaves that have been killed. Has not known any of our wars. You notice that we go to war, kill people, get our, our kids killed and come back and nothing happens. Do you notice that 22 to 28 soldiers are killing themselves every day in this country? Why are they killing themselves? PTSD? <coughs> it's only PTSD or what is it that is happening to their souls that is not coming back with the soldier? What is happening in that ordeal of initiation that is war? And they are among us. I talk in universities and sometimes there are uh, people who have served uh, in the army. And for me, it's now a big size of that. For so, some people have the archetype of the warrior, and they need to go. They need to go. The problem is that our army doesn't create warriors. It creates killers. It's one of the most sophisticated killers in the history of the world. And now we have them in Las Vegas, doing drones, uh, uh, flying drones from Las Vegas, and dropping bombs everywhere else. So, but what does it do to us, not only these kids, these young people, men and women, who are doing this horrible work for us, but also to a society that allows that. So, one thing that I have found that maybe we can start dealing with this collectively is ritual. And theater has allowed me to, to try to dig into the roots of the imagination of each place into their stories, into their rituals, into their practices. So maybe now I'm going to show you one way. Is that okay? So let, let's, uh, let's have this gorgeous poem that someone brought. Thank you. Uh, ah. so I'm going to, to call one of the oldest ways that people used to do uh, when they gathered. They said that when people gathered, it was important to call the ancestors. And there are many ways to do that. Praying is one way. Dancing is another way. Telling stories is one of the oldest ways. Drumming. There is no culture without a drum. There is no living being without a drum. Another way is through stories. Because stories are like storehouses. And what is stored in the stories is the wisdom of the people that were here before us, meaning the ancestors. And notice that I'm going to tell you a story about playing an African drum. But this is a story from India, and I'm going to tell it to you in English, with a Colombian accent. <laughs> it's a multicultural world now. So they say that once upon a time, once at the beginning of time, the first man, whose name was Manu, was walking in the shores, where the most fluid, the ocean, meets with the most solid, Earth. And he was walking there thinking about his problems. It seemed that he had some problems with his wife and his children and the people from the village. And he was there immersed in his own thoughts. When all of a sudden he heard a voice that said, Get me out. Please, get me out. 
see anything. But then you heard the voice again. Please help me out. Please help me out. And then he noticed that out of the water was jumping a little fish. And the little fish was saying, please get me out. Please get me out. And it was in the time that human beings could understand the language of animals. So Manu stopped and thought about a moment. And I'm happy to tell you that he decided to listen to this small thing. And he went into the water and he took the fish into his hand. And then you know fish out of the water. He ran back to his hut and there he found a container. He put water on the container and he put the fish. And then he gave the fish some food. And as soon as the fish ate the food, the fish grew, outgrew the container. So he went and looked for what now would be like a bathtub. I don't know how they call it. In that time, he filled it with water. He put the fish down into the bathtub and then he gave it some food. And the fish immediately outgrew the bathtub.
I want you to remind humans that it is the mistakes of humans that the gods learn. And I want you to remind them of all the practices that are needed for people to stay together. And all the practices that are needed for people to communicate, to listen to each other, to work together, to construct, because it would be very easy for them to learn to destroy. And I don't know what else the fish told Manu. And it looks like Manu did some of those things. Otherwise, we would not be here. At least that's what the story said. And this is an old story from the people of India. And I really like it. I like what they said to us. But I like more what we listen when we listen to a story. stories is not to interpret the story. If you interpret the story, you kill it. Leave that to teachers. No? <laughs> to standardize teachers. Do you know that we, we created something called a standardized education? Have you ever seen a standard child? It doesn't exist. Every child is unique. It's completely unique. But the idea with the stories is to see what moment in the story, what image in the story talk to you. So maybe, let's see, who wants to share what? What in the story got your attention? Anything. The fish growing. The fish growing. And very fast. The fish growing. What else? The music connection describing the first biblical story and how that story is similar. Similar stories. Tell similar stories. They tell similar stories in different ways, though, but it's, it's all the They found over 7,000 stories of flood, of universal flood, it, especially in communities where there is no water, in desert communities, in forests. Uh, and maybe, maybe the idea of the flood is that there are moments in life, in life in which everything changes. That flood is about change. It's about absolute change. But, so the flood and the connection to the Noah's Ark. Yeah. What else? That he couldn't that he didn't notice the weight of the fish as he was taking them to different places. That man could understand it. Yeah. The fish. Yeah, they said that the indigenous people don't get uh, surprised that animals talk or that trees or plants talk or that the nature talks. They get surprised that we can understand it, that we can hear it, we still can hear it. What else? Anything in the story? So the whale throwing the lap, the rope, and pulling the ship. Okay. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? That he nourished the fish. That he nourished the fish. That the fish, even though it was a god, needed help from the human. And I like this about Hinduism. I, I don't know if you have been in, in India or Nepal or these places or where Hinduism, where they believe that God is everywhere. So you sit on God, you breathe God, you eat God, you, I like that. This polytheism is a very interesting concept about the divinity and that God is in everybody, is in all of us. Uh, but that God needs us, or that idea that it is in people that, that the gods learn, in people's mistakes, in humans' mistakes that gods learn. Uh, so, I'm not going to interpret the story because each one of us has our own story and our own interpretation and takes from the story whatever resonates. Uh, they say that what you see in the story is often where you are. And if you use stories as a therapy, you can go deeper into what resonated for you in the moment. But I like this idea of flood as change and this mystery of why the fish doesn't seem to to bother him, the, the way of the fish. So the idea is that if each one of us, I, I have found this in almost any culture, that all human beings come to the world 
to bring gifts. The, the, the Greeks call it the daimon, uh, that later became the demon in Christianity. But the daimon, the resident spirit on each person. The Romans call it the, the genius. But then we reduce it, there are some geniuses, 134 IQ or something like that. No, they believe everybody had a genius. Everybody had something completely unique that we bring to the world. The Native Americans call it the, the medicine, that we live our lives and we survive our lives and we go through all the ordeals that we go through in life to find the medicine. And once you find that medicine, that medicine is to be given. Once you find the gift, that gift is not to be sold to the best uh, buyer. No, that gift is to be given. So you know when you are given from your gift, when the more you give, the more you have to give. You're finding yourself like, oh, if I do this technique, everybody will copy it. Or this theory that I just found 40 years working on this damn theory, and then, or this book that I just published, and they're going to copy it in China and sell it for one penny, etc. That's not your gift, that's a talent. That could be a good thing to have. And I'm glad, I hope that you make a lot of money with it or a good living. But the gift is that thing that you have that you give. And you cannot not give it. So I like these ideas because working with kids in prisons and kids who thought that they were an accident, in an accidental world, that they were here because the condom broke, that they were here but their parents were not waiting, that they were an accident. When they hear these stories, they seem to like it. They seem to fuck, man, shit. So all the shit that has happened to me has meaning. The problem is that I need to create the meaning. Not my father, not the teacher, not the priest, not the psychologist. I have to find the meaning of my life and hopefully be celebrated when I'm gone. Uh, it seemed to bring some hope to them. And for me, it has also helped me a lot in my own process of, of being born in a, in a very dangerous place, in a very violent country, in a very violent society, having gone through so many losses and hating hating people and trying to think about revenge was not very really helpful. And especially when I had my own children, it wasn't helpful to hate America and to hate Americans and to hate uh, the world. It wasn't, I didn't want to get that. I had to process that myself. And then as you walk, work with your wound, you find the blessings in the wound. You find the medicine in the wound. I had a book that is called The Blessing is Next to the Wound that is uh, it's an African saying. Uh, and, it's, uh, and I feel in my work also that when I go to a community that is wounded, our work is to find the gifts, is to find how that community, how that family as therapist, how that person has been able to overcome or could overcome the things that had happened to them. And then one of the ways I made that uh, present is through ritual. And there are rituals that are very personal. There are rituals that are, I don't know, are you familiar with the, the work of Jodorowsky, a Chilean? Uh, yes, well, uh, so this is a lot of stuff happening that, that I think is very interesting. Is he, he creates uh, these incredibly unique, sometimes very bold rituals for people to trick the unconscious through the conscious. <laughs> so uh, the language of the unconscious is metaphor, is images, is, yeah, and so he creates metaphors using the consciousness to trick the unconscious that it went through the ordeal. And I think that theater and rituals also allow us to do that. We did not find the bodies of these people that we put in the water. We did not dig into the waters and, and took those bodies out. But we did something that hopefully will help us continue processing that horrible situation of losing the loved one and not being able to bear, to bury it, or not being able to even know they are there. So it, it, when there is trauma, there is no abreaction, there is no releasing of the pain, releasing of that energy. Theater and dance and things that involve the body allow us to do that. I'm not saying that you do it and then you're done. No, you have to do it and do it and do it and do it again. The, I, I think the animals are always teaching this 
uh, uh, in many ways. I, I don't know if you notice that the gazelles are eating, you know, they're eating and they're having fun and talking and, and flirting with each other. And, uh, but at the same time, they are paying attention and yes, I, the tiger comes. And, wow, this incredible monster. And they run all over the place. Finally, the tiger gets the sick gazelle or whatever it is. Uh, put his teeth in the, in the flesh and there is a huge release of hormones, it looks like, to deal with the pain. And the other ones just finish. Wow, it wasn't me this time. And they don't go like, hey, do you know if the giraffe, the psychoanalyst has any, any appointments for this week? Or <laughs> this fucking tiger, man, is like, I'm so traumatized with this thing. No, they go and they jump and they check it out. They use the parasympathetic system to get rid of that energy and they continue with the life. Human beings forgot to do that. I don't know when, I don't know where. We're supposed to do this through language, but sometimes it's not enough. So we keep accumulating this trauma, this energy in our body, and it becomes cancer and it becomes all kinds of things. Theater, dance, the arts used to be a place where humanity heals. It used to be the place where we did the dances. And if you go to the people who still practice this, uh, they dance for days. You know, some dance. And at the end, they mark that in their bodies. They hang themselves, how do you say it? Uh, until they break through. And, and for some of us, it's like, wow, that's so horrifying. And that's so terrible. Uh, but no, they mark the fact that you went through it. And everybody sees that. In Australia, when the kids go, in most of the tribes, when the kids go through initiation at age 14, 15, 16, they knock one tooth out. So everybody knows, they mark the body. In Africa, the scarification and circumcision, of course we have uh, female uh, mutilation of the clitoris, which is also another issue, a big issue, in Somalia especially, in Sudan. Uh, and a lot of people are working on finding other ways, not telling them don't do that, that's barbaric, that's this or that, but how they can create other ways to symbolize what they need to symbolize with these practices. So for me it's important to recreate this. And art and theater and dance uh, has been my way of exploring this. Of course in anthropology there are lots of studies about that. And, and I would love to hear more. So this is like a little <coughs> framework of how I use stories and how I use circles uh, uh, to, to dig into the, the, the places where I go and then how we design things with people. And sometimes it's very simple. When I, I, I shared yesterday that I went to Chocó recently uh, to the place where the, the guerrilla committed a huge massacre of 84 people, 114 died from the wounds, uh, up to 114. And then we went back to the church, and what I asked people was to bring an object. To bring an object that reminded them of what happened. So people brought all kinds of things. And I remember this woman brought one uh, earring. And she said, this is the only thing that was left from my mom. Because she was close to the Christ, and that's where the, where the bomb fell, and she was just pulverized. And so she could find only one, and she gave it to me. I said, please, no, I cannot take that. And she said, no, because you're going to come back. When you come back, I receive it. So sometimes it's, it's dangerous to ask for these things, but, but, but the object becomes a way for people to tell their stories. In Syria, this woman brought an acorn, and she said, this acorn was given to me by my kids, my students, because our school was bombed. And they gave it to me and said, we will plant it when we come back. So she carried that with her, and it was an acorn. You can find millions of them on the street, but it, it was imbued with meaning, imbued with, with uh, significance for her. Uh, so that makes sense, yeah, or not. I don't make sense a lot, but it's, uh, we will we'll do it together. So. <laughs> anyway, so question. Let's, let's make it this a dialogue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sometimes with ritual, one thinks that part of the power comes from its repetition. That is, it's something you do every year, for example. It's not something that you create out of de novo. It's, um, and that's because of the way it, 
reminds you of your past or your connection to a tradition of some sort. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rituals that you're talking about are rituals that are consciously contrived, I don't mean contrived in the negative side, created uh, to, to be vessels for particular emotions and symbols. I was just wondering about your thought about the spe specific role of the traditional ritual compared uh, to the constructed totally, ritual. Totally, totally. And I, I think it was Margaret Mead who said that we need to recreate all rituals because we, how many of us have rituals in our lives? Well, I'm very happy that some of you do. Most of us were born in rites. Like I went to church, Catholic church. That was based on a ritual for many, many years. But now it was the most empty rite I could, it was the most empty repetition that as a child had no meaning for me. It used to be that before you took the corpse of Christ, the hostia, in your mouth, you used to uh, ajunar, to fast. To fast. So that thing would not taste like potato chips or, or Doritos or Doritos or nothing like that. It would taste like something else. But all those things had been disappearing. And so our right at repetition is not enough. I think most of us had lost that connection to ancient rituals. I'm very interested in ancient rituals. I'm particularly interested in the use of me medicines in South America, ayahuasca, yahe, uh, mushrooms, magic mushrooms, etc., in a ritualistic uh, setting. It's one of the most powerful experiences that I, I ever had in connecting to the expansion of the mind and the expansion of life. I, I've never seen God except uh, when, when I am with ayahuasca and, and it shows it to you, it's, it's incredible. Uh, yes, what, what I'm trying to, to bring back is the, uh, what I find is the starvation, my own, uh, because all that I do is for my own exploration. It's for my own healing, it's for my own transformation. Sometimes I hope it echoes the groups that I'm with, and it's also a need that I see in them. I see this need in, in working with you. I see this need working with people dying. I see this need in every community that I work. The need to come together and do something in common, to communicate, to do something in common. And that creates community. I agree with you. Hopefully, the rituals that we create have some foot or some roots in the ancient, and that's why I bring a story or a song. I ask them often, I ask the elders in the group. When I was in Bojaya, in this place in Chocó, they were indigenous people, Afro-Colombians, uh, Afro and a priest from another village. So I asked the indigenous to open the, what we did. So they did some cleansing with the plant. They went and they collected some plants, they went to the river, they brought the water, they did some prayers, and then they cleansed all of us. Then I asked the Afro-Colombian women to sing the alabados. The alabados are the traditional songs, all from Africa, that they sing when someone dies. So they did that part. Now, I didn't put music or, or, or sing. And then the, the priest, I asked him to please do something, but not a mass. But we didn't have time. I don't like masses, but I, I, said, I said, and he was great because he created his own uh, a ritual with corn, and he used the Bible, and everybody was very cool with it. So I think we are trying to recreate. That's more what I'm saying. And maybe to say that it's a ritual is too much. I don't know. Uh, let's problematize this because I'm I'm trying to to find the language for these practices. Uh, but I agree that I think that ritual has to be of the moment and rooted in ancient wisdom. That being original simply means to go back to the origins. It's not I'm doing the big thing. I mean, this is very ancient. <coughs> to sit and play a drum and tell a story is very ancient. So, so yes, we need to refeed from all these things because I particularly don't see in the academic world, the scientific, the scientific world, the ideological world, a lot of answers. So, so it's, it's, it's my own. It's, it's where I'm interested in right now. But I agree with you. It's great to go to a community where things happen. I I, I also did something recently, and a woman from. Colombia, who has been in Africa, said, I cannot do it. 
and, and I was surprised because she was so interested in what we were doing. And I asked her, and she said, I went to Africa and they brought me to this, uh, they brought me to two ceremonies. In one, they said, where did you come from? And I said, from Colombia. And they said, ah, they thought that it was uh, here in, in Columbus. And, and, and they said, no, Colombia. So she showed them in a map where, and they were amazed and they said, wow. You are like our grandchildren coming back to Africa. So they said, please come back tomorrow. We want to welcome you. And then she said she came back, and the entire village was there. And they created this path for her with the children. And they were singing and drumming. And she had to enter and enter into the ocean from where the ships of slaves were taken out. She was in Sierra Leone. And then she, she walked there, and there they took her clothes off. They washed her, the women. And then they put new clothes and they gave her a new name. And she said, that was amazing. But then a guy fell in love with her and, and, sh and took her to another ritual. And she said she doesn't know what happened there. But the guy gave her some masks and she was possessed and she was having dreams that he was having sex with her. And, and anyway, it was a voodoo kind of thing. And so she had to go through another person to ask her to destroy that, that mask because she was being watched. Uh, anyway, so she was very, so that power <laughs> of, of, I don't, I, I'm not connected to that, I wish I was connected to that kind of power, but that is something that they breathe in the culture. That they breathe in, in Burkina Faso, uh, in the Dagara tribe, when someone dies, they sit them on a chair. And then there are two women here with uh, funny, uh, funny the, the mosquitoes and all of that, although they put all kinds of birds. And then there is a semicircle, and no one can enter that. And there is the, the immediate family uh, mourning. And then there is another semicircle, and then, then is the extended community, and no one can enter that. And they, everybody has to come to the funeral. And they believe if there aren't enough tears, the soul cannot live. So someone will make a mistake, often a little child, enter the circle and dies. They drop dead. Boom. How does that happen? And it happens. Because in that culture, if you do that, you die. So then there is more tears, and they know that it's the responsibility of the entire village, that there were not enough tears. And that's why someone is sacrificed. But besides that, the amazing, like for example, they, they are very expressive. So a woman starts pulling her hair off and screaming, and then other women do the same. Because every time someone dies, it's an opportunity for all of us to cry out there. As therapists, we have people 30 years later in the therapeutic session crying for the grandfather who never, you know with unprocessed morning. Or someone starts screaming, and uh, this woman runs and runs and runs and finds a tree and starts hitting the bark, what do you call it? The, the bark of the tree. And they don't go, please stop, take this medication, it will help you. No, no. Someone puts the hand so she doesn't break her. Uh, and then someone else takes a, a, a cloth and puts it on the hand until she finishes. And now they are creating a movement and they are finding a rhythm and then it's beautiful how they come back with that rhythm, you know, and etc. So it's, yeah, it's incredible when you go to a community that has ancient rituals still alive. I don't see many of them except going to the mall every Sunday. And that is, and that, those are the rituals of, that's not the real name, but of consumerism that are what happen when you don't know that you came to the world to give. So when you don't know that you came to the world to give, you think you came to the world to consume. And as they say, you can never have enough of what you don't really need. <laughs> it's like we, we bury ourselves in stuff that we don't need because we don't know why we came to the world. And, and, and that's so true about America. It's, it's one of the best definitions of what's, what's happening with us that, that I ever heard. Any other comments and, or questions or problematize, problematize this? We go every New Year's Christmas to Jamaica. Oh, wow. To the beach. And one year, somebody brought these 
balloons that they hang a candle under a paper globe that they hang a candle on the globes at night. Yes. And it goes up and the wind carries it out over the ocean. One or two one year. And the next year, people just started bringing them. <coughs> and this last year, there were hundreds. Yes. Uh, this was, became a, a ritual, yeah, a celebration of the new year, not in the drinking or <coughs> singing because sending out these messages to the ocean. Yes. And, it, and it's fun that people from all around the world will come back again the next year and have their goals. I think we're starving for things like that. And they are about <laughs> beauty and they are yeah. and it's not about money. It's not about big productions. They're often very simple. Although rituals of healing are very sophisticated, they take years. Sometimes they take a year to prepare and you need the, the hairs of a, the tail of a black horse on a 12. And, but these are other things. These are other things that the ancient cultures still have. We're trying to recreate something as a response to a need in the moment and, and tap, tapping into all this wisdom with all respect because it's, yeah. I'm just thinking about uh, some of the things that you're saying about these rituals of death. And um, I think I mentioned to you when we were talking the other night that my students are reading a, a, a novel called Praise Song for Widow, which is set in the Caribbean environment, uh, in a place called Cariaco. And so there are lots of, uh, the spirit world is very rich there. And one of the, the, the lead characters, the, the protagonist is a woman who has never mourned. She hasn't really mourned the death of her husband. And uh, I, that uh, story resonates with me so strongly because what's happening uh, in the black community is that we are not mourning, allowing ourselves to mourn because it's not convenient to do the things, and this might be tradition rather than, than ritual. The traditional way that we dealt with our dying people was that we had a funeral. <coughs> you know, I mean, we had a wake, and we had a funeral, and, and people cooked food and brought it. And all this is changing so that it's not convenient to have the funeral, so you have, you know, have your loved one go out and get cremated, and then when it's convenient for everybody, you have a memorial service. Um, and, and, and then go to if there is any food to cater, or you go to a restaurant. Uh, and, and, and so I was thinking about that because when my father died, that was the kind of thing that we were going to do. And I said, you know, we're going to have a funeral. I don't pay for it, you know, we're going to have a funeral. Uh, and uh, the other family, uh, my other sister, had already made this plan that dad was going to be said he was going to be cremated. Well, he was cremated, but we have a funeral. And the, everybody gathered back into the house. That was the house that we grew up in. It was the last time we were all together, you know, the kids, the siblings, the grandchildren, great grandchildren, the nieces and nephews. And it, that was my effort to say, hey, hold up for a minute. This is not part of our tradition, you know. You don't sit around and say, okay, we're going to get around to it on there these people. And I'm wondering uh, if, uh, to some extent, if this, this kind of, you know, convenient way of, 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 of dealing with your loved ones is not having some kind of effect on folks, you know, down the road, where they're not mourning, they're not grieving, not having, you know, and, and, and that can create problems. I mean, I cried a lot, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the most dehumanizing thing that we have as a culture is that we are completely denying that. And death has become like, like an accident of medicine. Uh, like a, and death has become the end of life. It used to be part of life. Life used to be seen with a larger vision. And, and when a culture denies death, it denies life. Because we're constantly dying. There are small deaths and then is the big death. The, the, but the life was a preparation for death. And death was a celebration of one's life, not the end of the life. Regardless of what you think about the other world, I don't know what that is. I just hope to enjoy it as much as it is. I, I'm busy with this one. 
but but, it's, but I, all religions, all philosophies started, and I think most art started with a thought, a thinking about death. Today, we don't even touch our death. We don't even throw little rocks. To our, now it's machines that lower the body or take the body to the oven and then we're given this little powder afterwards that who knows who is it? Who knows? And carry some of my father. My father just died in January. And, and I, so me, my family did the novena, the nine days of prayer. And it was very funny because all the old ladies from the neighborhood came and no one knew the novena. So I was laughing and they were very furious with each other because how is it that no one has a novena? Because it's a different kind of praying than the rosary. I said, don't worry, this is perfect for my father, who was a joker. So they just, and so every time they pray, I left the house, I stay outside. And then after, I created something, some kind of little ritual. So in the first uh, day, I said, well, well, so let's talk about my father. Because we need to celebrate him. And I made a little altar for him with pictures and objects that were meaningful to him. <coughs> a watch that he had for years that didn't work. He was developing Alzheimer's, so he, every day he would tell you that he broke. Uh, anyway, so, but I made it about talking. And the second day we talked about secrets about him. Oh my God, the secret is about him. Even my mom was laughing. And, uh, and I thought my mom was going to die that day because they, they had been together for 57 years. No, for 57 years. So, but I could feel that even though they pray every day, every night, they appreciated something different. Something that allows us to cry and laugh and connect and the humor, which is something that has disappeared <laughs> from culture. <clears throat> and in the humor is the humus. Have you seen a lot of humor in academia? Or a lot of humor in therapy, or a lot of humor or imagination in, in families. It's amazing how dehumanized we have become, and this idea that it, it is inconvenient that someone died. That's all the industrial broad society that, that is forcing us to be uh, consumers and therefore workers to have money to consume. But not humanized. It was beautiful to come together to celebrate life and to remember our death. It's another African saying that there are two kinds of death. The living dead and the dead death. And the living dead are those that we still remember. <coughs> Part of my play is a way to remember my brother. And on Saturday I'm going to, to do my play is a way to honor my, my brother's life through beauty. I mean, he was an activist, so it's, so it's an activist act, but, but it's mostly about beauty, it's about remembering the same. But yeah, it's, it's terrifying that we live in a culture that loves death. So, it's losing life. But when I was working in hospice, I wanted to work with, uh, in senior centers. Could you assume that the seniors are getting closer to death? And so they are supposed to be becoming elders, not older. But we have the largest number of old people in history. We don't have that many elders. If you don't believe me, look at Congress. I don't see elders. Elders don't send people to kill people. So the kids often send me here this thing and say, how do I know if my grandfather is an older or an elder? And I said, is he weird? But if he's weird, he's an elder. <laughs> so the, the elders look more and more like themselves, and less and less like everybody else. So I say, if he looks like everybody else, he's in the polls. I'm not saying that. But he's like, Grandpa. <laughs> so, so we created a program called The Second Adventure of Life, that was to talk about the five wishes and about thinking, how do I want to walk? And, and working with the families, how do you want to celebrate your parents' life? Or your kid's life with, in, in, with an IV, with uh, artificial survival? Because we, we are very good as a culture in keeping cadavers with IVs. All hospitals are filled with that. 
You know that most of the expenses in our so-called healthcare system that has nothing to do with health nor care is on the last five days. That we spend millions of dollars keeping a person who is dead with resuscitation and all this kind of shit. <coughs> it's no dignity in that. And they die alone. And they die afraid. A person who is alive is fine. Che Guevara used to say, when death find me, I will welcome for as long as I'm doing uh, fighting for the oil. Che Guevara, his ideas. <coughs> but he was alive. He was ready to die at home. Any other questions? Oh, I don't know what time it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Today I heard a story about the Martin Lutheran Church outside of the minister uh, recently appeared at a, a happiness session of the church. Happiness Sunday morning. He dressed as a clown. Oh. And he told jokes. All the whole sermon was jokes. Now that church he's starting to get very interested. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But he started a new, he broke the ritual. Not the usual thing that people go to suspect. But he broke it. With a uh, purpose, I don't know. I'm not sure you find out why. It has to be alive. It, it ritually has to be with the moment. Not just a rite that repeats itself, an empty rite. An empty movement. Yeah. So I have a question in terms of the ways in which rituals that are used for perpetuation of violence, for perpetuation of hatred, ones where the dead are born for blood sacrifice, how those fit in. And I guess I'm thinking specifically of the 11th, uh, the 11th or the 12th marches of the Ireland, and sort of the idea of honoring those who have died in the past as a way of guaranteeing that. We have plenty, plenty of, of rituals that celebrate death, of rites of passage into death, not into life. Uh, I mean, our society is filled with them. The industrial growth society is all about transforming the earth, a living thing, into a planet, an object that we have in pieces cell, and we have transformed the earth into a sewage system, into a trash. Um, yes, we are such so genius in creating this kinds of repetition of revenge and hatred and, and how we continue doing it. I think the challenge for us, and, and I think artists has a lot a uh, strong role to play in that, is how do we create rituals that celebrate life? As strong as that. Because I told in Northern Ireland, I told the, the people from the IRA and the UBF and the UDF, you have to create rites of passage for your youth because putting, uh, memorializing the past with with uh, graffiti, with uh, murals and statues is not making it for them. They need, and the same, the, the gang members are initiating each other, but it's an initiation into death, not an initiation into life. <coughs> it's also an initiation into certain kind of businesses, and, but, but they are very strong. You have to mark yourself. So when I work with them, I said, you know why you are tattooing yourself? Because, and then I showed them the Maori people, and I showed them, and they are like, fuck, man, that's cool. I said, yeah, but you have to do certain things to deserve this. I said, yeah, man, these tears are my dead people, or the people I have killed, or etc. But. I, I, I invite them to notice that all of those are initiations into death, not into life. Because something has to die. When, when a child goes from the rite of passage from childhood into adulthood or into elderhood, uh, the child dies. And indeed the community has all the celebrations when they weep the death of the, of the, of the child and when the kids come back you know the three moments of initiation, when you are taken out of the parental path, and then you go to the ordeal of initiation, and you are, uh, you are faced with all kinds of things, some people even die, and then when you come back, the most important part, and the one that is most lost in our culture, is you are celebrated. 
as something and someone new, and you are given a new name, and you are given the poporo among the Kogi people, and you, you get circumcised, you, you get scarified. It is marked in the body that you went through the initiation. In some tribes, in Benin, in, in, in Sudan, etc., you are not circumcised, no woman will allow you to touch them. I don't care how old you are. Because that means you have not gone to the initiation. So, but they, they knew that something has to die, that something has to be sacrificed. And now we know you went through this. What is our rites of passage? When do you know you are a woman in our society? When do you know you are a man? When I want the dad members, we said, a gun doesn't make a man. A child giving birth doesn't make a woman. It's not enough. It's a physical, biological thing. But if you don't go through it, it's, you can do it over and over and over. It's a repetition, the compulsion to repetition. I feel that if we don't heal, we kill. I think this culture is engaged in killing because we have not done the thing. And that's true about human beings, and the compulsion to the, or the symptom to repeat, to marry the same guy with different last name. One of my patients used to say, she was in her fourth divorce and said, wow, I just realized I had married the same asshole with different last names. <laughs> uh, because it was a compulsion. And I think it's true about cultures too, about societies. Talk about Israel. I mean, yes, we went through the Holocaust and they are using that as an amazing uh, founding myth and no more, but not no any. They, they are doing the same to the Palestinians from what I said. They are now killing six million Palestinians. Is that going to give us back the six million Jews that were killed? No. Uh, but what about America? America is very much like that. It's a colonized country, a colonizing country that that created a huge mass. And we are all the sons, and we are walking on this on this dry blood, but it's there. And if we feel it, so what do we do? It's horrible. It's, it's really difficult to look at these things. And I feel that one of the big problems that we have is how do we look at, at this on the face and still st stay alive? And I feel that beauty and healing and rituals, when we all do it together, ritual is like a place where we experience something we need to experience, but we cannot experience alone. So, okay. Well, we do all of the world to create rituals or to help them. Do you, do you wait to be invited, or do you say, oh, I want to be there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I wait to be invited. Yeah, it's, it's because I don't have the capacity to conjure the people. There has to be someone doing the work in the community. I mean, here at the university, I mean, even, but, I, but I, I used to travel to places and to get... I love to go to places where we don't have this uh, incredible capacity to consume things. Uh, I, if I was in Madras right now, there would be 4,000 people here. It's because it's, it's, they, they are starving for things. They want to know, they want to see the world. Salute. The, in Africa, they would say the spirit agrees. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I, but I, to do the work, you need to be invited. Yeah, we cannot fall in parachute as the saviors to. We have done that. All colonizing enterprises have been very well intentioned. Talk about Christianity and all of that stuff. Yeah. And uh, or what we're doing, we're bringing democracy to the Middle East, destroying the Middle East. Isn't that beautiful? Like, like the Statue of Liberty used to be the symbol of freedom. Now is this woman carrying weapons and crossing the oceans. Now she doesn't even need to cross the ocean, she sends drones all over. Um, yeah, dude. How long do you stay? It depends. It depends. I try to stay as long as possible or to return <clears throat> and to continue. I, now with the Skype is the best invention in the world. So I, I am constantly on Skype, with, like today I was with people in Syria and people in Ukraine, because I'm going to Ukraine in two weeks. <coughs> I was there uh, two years ago, 
And so, uh, and it's mentoring, uh, which is another thing that I am very interested in. Is, yes, uh, academic education is very important, but mentoring is the oldest way. And, and I, I wonder why uh, most, uh, most people don't do mentoring. Mentoring is that you see someone that has the gift that you have, and is younger than you, and you probably, hopefully, have more access to things. And then, uh, the, the mentor is someone who shares resources with someone else who has the same, who worships the same God. And, and it's not just one way, it's not that I, the mentor, the older one, uh, uh, help you, the mentee. No, I also see in you things that I no longer do. Or you do things in a way that I never thought of. You, the dancer, you. So I, I had a program in, in a middle school in LA. So I had all these African-American kids that were brilliant uh, basketball players. But that's what they are told is the only way out. But who am I? I was like, man, you're fucking good. And they look at me like this. Because they are all like this. So I said, and their father, and their father said, you're good, you're good to have, but who are we? So I went to the Lakers and I said, look, I know you have to do a lot of community service. You know why. <laughs> and so I'll give you all the hours you need, but you need to come to the school because it was only like 20 minutes. And you have to see these kids for 20 minutes, talk to them, and come back in six months or three months. And then I'll give you two days, three days of community service. And they agree. So I will tell the kids, man, play. I said, what? Yeah, play. So these guys will come to the school. We had to, to do it only during recess, because, not during recess, because otherwise it was impossible. And then the kids would play, and the guys would come and say, wow, man, you're good. Very good. Ah, the kids would Because it's Shaquille, not Shaquille O'Neal, but someone like him would say to you, you're good. It's very different than Hector, the psychologist, the little <laughs> magic midget there that knows nothing about basketball. But they said, why do you do this shit? What? I said, so the guys would go and why do you do this? So they said, Hector, bring me a tie. I said, I don't have a tie, but I will bring something. So he would tie this kid's arm and said, you have to do this half an hour a day. So the mom will call me to and say, he is shooting the ball at two in the morning. <laughs> I said, yeah, because he's disciplined. Because the discipline is to be a disciple of something. Because such and such told him, what can I do? You complain that he doesn't do shit, he's doing something. So anyway, so six months later they come and they can see this kid from the other side. I mean, he can go to the other school and throw the damn ball. And now they can say, fuck oh, man, cool. But how do you do this? And I think, what? How do you jump over the jump? Because some kids can jump over the jump. So now there is this love affair, which is what teaching is. Uh, but it's through the muse. I don't have the muse. So you need to find someone who sees who you are and you see yourself being seen to save your life. And if you are a teacher, if you are a therapist, if you are a community organizer, you better carry that medicine. However, it's very difficult to see the gift in someone if you don't know what your gift is. And if you don't, Shit, <laughs> pretend because <laughs> because you have to because the kids are waiting, the kids are waiting, and you and it, it this doesn't happen with all the students and this ha doesn't happen every year. But the Greek color when diamonds is diamond, and some teacher said when you see a kid and they see you seeing them, it keeps you going for another two years, it keeps you alive. So it's a two-way thing, the, this idea of mentoring. Um, so I, I, when I go to a community, I try to bring people to finance the trip because it's expensive to go to Africa or India or Nepal. So I use Europeans and, and American students who come. Then we do trainings in the morning and in the afternoon we apply the techniques to, with the community so the community benefits. We all benefit from the exchange <coughs> and I can finance uh, my trip. And, but I, and if not, I, I try to go back. So there are some places that I have been able to continue going back and then mentoring the people in the ground. Thank you. Anyway, and if any of you are interested in how this works, not the carreta, but how it works, uh, we will be doing some work with uh, young people from the high school. 
uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and you are all welcome. Anyone who wants to come, if you have time and desire, uh, it would be great because one of the things that all, we also have lost is the intergenerational exchange. In every other culture, you see the older with the, with the young, with the youth, with the child. The, the, the job of the elders is to be with the youth because those two groups are not very productive. They are not in this. So, because the elders are the only ones who can see the youth, if they have been seen. And that saves lives. We, in this society, we lost that. And that's why most of the elders are developing. The, the kids have ADHD, attention deficit disorder, a deficit of attention of the culture in them. But we diagnose the kids. <coughs> Not that some kids don't have the problem. I, I, but almost 20 million kids taking with alcohol and drugs in the United States, I call that the assassination of the spirit. The chemical industry. And then the elders are developing AD, Alzheimer's disease. And I feel that is because a society that forgets its elders, they forget who they are. They no longer have a role. And their role is to be, to be with the youth and with the children. Because the children are bringing messages from the other world and the, and the elders are going into the other world. The problem is when the, el the elder is supposed to be the one who has one foot in the other world and one foot in this world. So they are like giving messages. And it's a very cool job. You know, because shit, these messages are fucking weird, you know. And, and then, because they create vision. But when the elders are walking like this into bed, it's very scary. It's very scary, but they keep accumulating and they keep holding. Look at this country. Who is in charge of this country? People over 65. They have most of the wealth, and they keep accumulating it. They have to lose it, so the economy moves, and the young people have jobs, and, and we transform this damn thing. But they are holding it because they feel they haven't lived their lives, most of them. Okay, these are ideas. I, I, don't, I cannot demonstrate them <laughs> or theorize them. But <laughs>